How did I go from this to this? Welcome to Heavenly Backyard Astronomy. Hi everyone, I'm Pat Prokop and I'm here in the Heavenly Backyard Garden. And ever since I started into astrophotography around 2015, my major goal was to photograph the Andromeda Galaxy. It's been a challenge, but I figured it out, I think, finally coming up with a decent uh, a view of the galaxy itself. The galaxy is two and a half million light years away, so what we're actually seeing is the galaxy as it appeared two and a half million years ago. But being our closest galactic neighbor, the galaxy itself is rather large up in the sky the sky view that is. Now, if you look at it through just a small telescope or binoculars, or even in the, uh, with your naked eye in the darkest areas uh, away from the city lights, it just looks like a fuzzy little star. You would think you should be able to photograph the galactic outlines and so forth with a regular telescope, but it's not the case. You have to have a wide field of view telescope to capture this large object up in the sky. Now, to give you an idea, let me show you the size of the galaxy. This is a, a black and white uh, photograph that I took using the uh, red filter on a monochrome camera of the galaxy. And compare it with the size of a full moon using the exact same settings. And there you can see uh, the full moon is just a little portion of the uh, view that the Andromeda galaxy extends. As a matter of fact, you can get four or five full moons in the view of the galaxy that uh, is taken with the uh, telescope. Now, my first telescope that I was using had an aperture of f10, uh, the focal ratio of f10. That's just too tight of a view. As a matter of fact, you can't even see the full moon uh, in that view because it crops it off. So f7 helps it. If you reduce it to f7, you can at least see the full moon, but you're not going to get the whole Andromeda galaxy. So. I went down to an F5, the uh, Orion ED80 telescope, F5.2, I think it is, and still I was not quite getting enough. So from there, I went to uh, using a reducer, an 8 tenth reducer, and that took the F ratio down to 4. Point, uh, what is it, 4.8, I believe. Anyway, that did give me the whole view of the galaxy. Let's go upstairs and take a look on Nina, the uh, different views that you would get with different F ratios on your telescope. All right, so let's go into Nina first of all and set up the um, viewing size and we can do that by going into the uh, uh, Sky Atlas, click on M31, type in M31, input search, of course I already had it in there, and then set for framing assistance or assistant, and there you can see this is a uh, f10 um, focal ratio. And there you can see it's cutting off quite a bit of the galaxy itself. The galaxy goes way out to here, to way out to here. Now let's say we had an f7, so this would be an f7. There you can see it's a little bit wider field of view, still cr uh, are cropping off a lot of the galaxy itself. So let's go to the um, uh, F6 and the image size will be bigger yet. Now I put the 8 tenth reducer on there, the uh, 0 0.8x reducer. And that takes it down to, there it is. There, I, I got most of the galaxy in there. See, I'm still missing a little bit right there and missing a little bit right here. Actually, it looks like it goes all the way out to here if you really want to be specific. But there, it, it gets most of the galaxy. And this is the framing that I used uh, on my system. Also, the pixel size of your camera will make a difference as well. Uh, this camera has a pixel size of 3.8. Uh, if you take it up to one of those 5.2s. Okay. There you can see it. it, it a larger pixel size in your camera will also give you a larger view in the image or a smaller pixel size. Uh, say for example 2.8 uh, gives you a smaller view as well. Again this camera is 
and the pixel size there and the camera view uh, that I'll be recording is this view right here. Now the telescope itself is this area here, this uh, carbon fiber tube, uh, 3.1 inches in diameter is the lens itself. And uh, with that I have the guide scope that is def definitely needed because I'm taking three minute exposures, uh, five minute exposure wouldn't hurt as well, but I used 180 seconds or three minute exposures. So I needed a good guide system to help to keep the stars sharply focused. Uh, on top of that, we have the uh, filter wheel that changes the filters. Since this is a monochrome camera, I'm using the uh, ZWO or ZWO ASI 1600mm monochrome camera. I have to use filter. This is an automatic filter changer and it has the red, the green, and the blue filter in there, plus a luminous filter and a uh, H-alpha filter in there as well. And this automatically uh, changes uh, on command uh, through the uh, programs that uh, use for capturing uh, deep space objects such as, well, S Sequence Generator Pro or Astrophotography Tool. Uh, I use NINA, uh, Nighttime Imaging in Astronomy, and it takes care of the filter changes and you can just set that up in the sequence. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Also on this telescope, I have the hand controller. Now I really don't use the hand controller anymore, uh, but I need it for this uh, scope uh, because I'm using a, uh, the Celestron uh, uh, CGM uh, mount, I, I need to connect the mount through the hand control. Now on the CGX mount on the other telescope, uh, it has a port already built in there for USB connection, so I don't even have to have the hand controller connected to that telescope to control it. But with this one, I have to have it. So I just Velcroed it to the, uh, the mount itself so when it uh, rotates, uh, it stays uh, following the telescope and doesn't dangle uh, away. And as, well, speaking of all the dangling wires and what have you, I have a lot of connections. So with the uh, guide scope and the guide camera, that's a USB connection. The camera itself is a USB connection. The um, filter wheel is a USB connection, but that one I can connect directly into the camera. So that's basically just one USB connection. And all these come up into this controller over here, and this is a USB extender. And it has all my connection cables going uh, from the different uh, uh, activities of the camera, uh, of the uh, telescope, into the USB controller, then that goes uh, down underground and then upstairs into my main computer, uh, which uh, then controls everything from inside the house. Also, I have an automatic focuser. The uh, uh, Pegasus Cube uh, helps with the, uh, actually it's, it's amazing, uh, automatic focusing uh, through Nina. And I do have the uh, 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 dew strap controller here. So the only two cables I have coming up from the ground attached to the telescope itself that would cause any drag on the tracking is the USB cable coming off the uh, extender. This is a CAT6 cable and it goes down underground, as I said, up into the uh, uh, main computer in the, uh, my control room. And then also I have a 12 volt power supply which is down here and uh, that runs up into here and then splits off and then I can control uh, the, uh, uh, the camera, the uh, dew straps, uh, and anything else, uh, well, the, um, uh, the uh, focuser, all require 12 volts. So they're all at 12 volts, so that's good. Even the uh, telescope mount itself is at 12 volts. So uh, one 15 amp 12 volt controller um, power supply supplies all the energy I need uh, to the, the, the rig itself. So the, only two cables, this one here and the power cable coming up for the 12 volts going into the telescope. I do have another telescope with the uh, uh, another type of connection. This this BMAX is actually a computer, and it, uh, I can either Wi-Fi it directly into my office or hardwire it, which I do with that Cat6 cable, right back into my office. And that bypasses the actual computer itself. I just remote into this computer, and everything's right there, including a USB 3 connection. Actually, two USB 3 connections on that computer. I'll be having more about this in my upcoming videos on how this system is working out. And it's so far going very well. After several days, if not weeks, of cloudy nighttime weather conditions, we finally had a break 
in the clouds. And for four nights, I had some clear weather conditions. Now, I also had a couple of nights of clear skies, but I was not available uh, to come out and do the astrophotography. But in early November, the sky did clear off and I was able to open up the rig. And the target, of course, was the Andromeda Galaxy, Messier 31 or M31. So let, let's do a quick run through on Nina. And the first thing you, after opening up is you go into the equipment here and uh, select the uh, camera. And there is the ZWO ASI 1600 millimeter uh, MM Pro. And connect. And there it is, camera connected. And you go to the filter wheel. And there's the uh, filter wheel, the ZWO filter wheel. And connect. Filter wheel connected. All right. And go into the um, focuser. It's the Pegasus Astro Focus Controller. Connect. And there it is, connected. And then I don't have a rotator. Um, with the telescope, I need to connect the telescope with your system. Anyway, I have the CPWI. You have to have something that is aligned with your telescope before you can connect the telescope. And the next thing, of course, is the uh, guider. And it's going to use PHD2. And it'll connect to that by first opening up PHD2 if it's not already open. There it is, it's open. And now it's going to go into um, my framing, the sky view, sky atlas rather. Uh, again, M31. Let's do that one. And search. There it is. So that's kind of like what you see in a small telescope when you're looking at M31. Just a, a fuzzy, out of focus looking star. And um, set as a framing assistant. All right, go to there, it brings it in, and let's go to uh, full screen. And I have the parameters set for uh, my system, which is the uh, F6 at, with an 8 tenth reducer on there. So it's going to be uh, F3 point or 4.8, something like that. Uh, focal length will be 384, and that's the view I'm going to be having. So then I can say uh, replace as sequin target. I can do that. It goes into the sequencer. And then I can set up the controls here. Uh, you want to put on the uh, start guiding when it starts, start uh, uh, slew to the target. And that will use the plate solving to uh, center the target. And then uh, on the autofocus, turn the autofocuser on and turn it on after each filter change. And then what I did is I used 180 seconds. Well, let's do a number. Of, let's just say uh, 20 uh, objects there, 20 frames. Uh, at 180 seconds each. That's a one hour exposure. And it's a light frame. And I'm going to use the red filter. And uh, I can dither on or off. I can dither how many frames, like every other frame if I want to. The gain is, I have it defaulted at 139 with an offset of 20. And there I have it. First uh, uh, sequence of events. But with Nina and with other programs as well. Uh, I can add the blue filter and the green filter. So let's add the uh, green filter right there. And then I can add the blue filter right there. If I want to, I can add luminous right there. So I can get this all done together. Now luminous, I'm going to take this down um, to zero because otherwise it'll blow it out. It'll be so much light. But otherwise, I keep it the same. And uh, there I can have all my um, images and so forth. And as soon as I hit go, uh, this will start recording. It'll do the red. And when it's done with the red, it'll go to the green. And once it goes to the green, it'll, since I have the change filter um, autofocus, change on filter change, uh, it'll autofocus on filter change. And then after it's done with the you know, 20 frames of the green, it'll go and change the filter to blue and do another autofocus. And right there, and again, go to luminance, uh, autofocus on that, and do that. And when it's all done, it'll park the uh, telescope and cool off or warm up the uh, sensor on the uh, camera and then close it down the system. That's nice. So I can actually, once I have this all set up, if everything's going well, I can actually go watch some more of my Star Treks, whatever I watch, or read a book, or go downstairs and, and watch some TV with my wife. But uh, I like these automatic programs. Plus, some of the targets that I want to get uh, used to have to wait until 
uh, they came in view to at about you know seven or eight o'clock in the evening. Now, if they come into view at two or three o'clock in the morning, I just can add another target over here. Let's say, for example, I want to get the um, Orion Nebula. Okay, that's what M42. I'm typing M42. Go for search. Finds it there. Well, I guess and uh, set for framing assistance. Assist. All right. And then you can just uh, add as a sequence target. And there it goes. It'll add it. And then you can add the, uh, uh, you can do the same thing um, as you did with the others. And um, over here is the Orion. And I can, I can set up all these different um, um, filters and go for it and then say go. But if I wanted to wait maybe a couple hours after it finished the uh, Andromeda Galaxy, maybe Orion wasn't quite high enough or it's behind those trees in my backyard. I can put in a delay start here in seconds and say if I want to delay it uh, an hour, it will be 360 or 3,600 seconds or 3,600 seconds to do that. And, uh, you know, let's change all these to on and autofocus on and on. And there you go, you're ready to go. And then you just hit um, play or start right there and it'll take off. There you have it. That's Nina. I love Nina. Nighttime imaging in astronomy. Our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, has about, oh, somewhere between 200 to 300 billion stars. That's a lot. But the Andromeda galaxy is bigger. It contains about a trillion stars. Imagine that, a trillion stars. And looking at all those stars, you wonder, you know, are we alone in this universe? I don't think so, but I don't know. Well, and we'll never know. But there they are. And that's just one of the galaxies of the billions of galaxies that are floating around in the universe. Well, I hope you like this video. And if, and if you like my uh, uh, astronomy videos, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, that would help me and it would help you perhaps. Uh, I learn a lot of information on astrophotography by watching all these different YouTube videos. And these uh, videos um, are available and, and for you to watch. And uh, if you subscribe, you'll be notified if you ring the little bell uh, anytime I upload a new video or if you subscribe to any of the other astronomy videos, uh, YouTubers, uh, you know, click on that little bell and subscribe and you'll be also notified when new videos are uploaded by those different YouTubers. So thanks for watching and unless you need rain, we just had another inch last night, unless you need rain, clear skies everyone. One of the questions I have been asked is, do I take down my rig after every night of observation? The answer is no, I'm just too lazy. <laughs> it takes a lot of time to put this thing together with all these wires and connections and so forth, and of course the polar alignment. Um, so it, it, I don't like taking the rig apart after each night. What I do though is cover it. I have a special cover that I put over the uh, scope itself, and this is an insulated cover. It's like a thermal bag itself, you see inside there. And this helps protect the telescope uh, over the short uh, period of time. Now, of course, if we had a hurricane or something like that coming, and there's one to the south of me, actually it's a cyclone, a tropical cyclone or a tropical storm, uh, Ada. Uh, if, if we are threatened by high winds, I will then take it down. Uh, but it takes about a half hour to disassemble this uh, system completely and then about another hour or so to put it back together again. So that, again, I'm just too lazy to do that. But I will cover them up uh, when I'm done uh, with the uh, uh, session during the nighttime hours. This one not only protects it from the rain and the elements, it also protects it from the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, which keeps it a little bit cooler on the inside. Yes, these are poinsettias. 
I planted from last year. I had them hanging on the front porch last year and I tossed them away in February, thought they were gonna die, but I looked in late March and they were still growing, rather ragged, they were still growing, so I trimmed them all the way down and then planted them in the ground. There was three hanging baskets and now they're beginning to bloom once again. Um, here we are in the southeast, we can do this. In the north, I'm pretty sure you can't do this at all because the, the frost will kill them. But uh, these are my poinsettias.